This is Hunt Nebraska, the official podcast for insight into Nebraska's hunting and shooting sports community. Be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, our space for sharing stories, information, tips, and techniques. Now, Hunt Nebraska. All right, here we go. We're getting the swing of this, guys. We are we getting really the swing are. Of this. this is episode four. Four. For this Hunt Nebraska podcast. Welcome back, folks. Whether you're listening to us in your car, at home, at work, wherever you might be, or watching us on YouTube, welcome, welcome. This is the fourth in our series, How to Deer. Yeah, we're and just it, getting good at this, I think. We're, we're, we're finally honing in on it. This is good. And, and, but to lead off, we got to make sure everyone subscribe to this, uh, this podcast so you know when our next episode drops, because there's going to be a, a few more of them. Today, we're talking about a year as a deer we're going to be talking a little bit of biology talking about what they're going through throughout the hunting season and throughout the entire calendar year now we started off with some intro on methods and permits and hunter ed requirements we talked about equipment for gear to deer we talked about uh some of the the strategies in our last session and and some of the things that you're doing out there we've got a lot more to go uh but we're going to talk about being a deer on this one and folks we've got jackson ellis hunter education coordinator jeff rollinson one of the assistant division administrators for communications division here at nebraska game and parks and just me hershey and we're going to try to squeeze as much deer hunting knowledge out of these two as we possibly can and just off camera so that you know she gets her kudos the one that uh, is pushing the buttons making us uh making this thing happen to be quite honest kind of the kingpin you. on all this yeah. to be honest with you building a new sound studio just for us and in, in this podcast uh kayla gattigan who is uh kind of keeping us on track this year on a lot of different things i know she's going to be going on a deer hunt during our october antlerless season uh this weekend so just to be clear to everybody deer season's on as we record this but we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening before this we're going to take a step back to right around that september 1st when archery deer season starts because we know there's a lot of archers out there that just chomp on the bet for that opportunity to get out september 1 regardless of how warm or cold or wet or dry it might be so we're going to start there and uh, who wants to take that? Who wants to talk about what the deer are going? Now, Jackson already raised his hand. Yeah, so I, 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 he's just jumping out of his chair. If you don't go with him, it won't be pretty. So maybe we should start there because I think biology, no one in your quarry is a big thing when it comes to hunting. It's just as big as the scouting that we talked about yesterday and uh, or in the last podcast where we talked about where to deer. Uh, so what September 1st, what are the deer doing? I mean, that's that's darn near still summer. Yep. Yeah, that first it's but that's when the first big change happens, in my opinion. So when you and you're going through the year and then you know, through the summer, these deer are just kinda of hanging out doing their thing. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But September first, we're starting to see the day length change a little bit. And oh, that's definitely. that's really what kind of triggers this first you know, technically kicks off the rut, you know. Bucks start rubbing off their velvet. The the velvet the antlers are fully formed underneath, starts to get a little itchy. And within a day or two of that that uh, kind of kickoff for each deer, it's a little different, but it's right about that September first, first week of September. They're gonna rub that velvet off and uh, show us what they're working with. This is pretty impressive. See, I was gonna save since he got to start, Jeff. I was gonna save a little bit of the rut talk for you, but he already broke it. I, I already mean, said he already it. brought it. He tied this one right in there. <laughs> He's territorial, and that's how he that's how he claims his territory. Just throws <laughs> random words out. Way to go, Jackson. Well, that's that's not- that was smooth. That is not a random word. That is that is that is no very, random in September, word. Very smooth, Jackson. Yeah. Very smooth. The only person I know who start the rut in September. Okay, yeah. that's good. And, and I think a lot of people get excited for that September. I think a lot of people get uh, excited for that September first archery kickoff because a lot of those deer are still in the box are still in velvet, and I think there's some folks that really highly prize that opportunity to take a deer in velvet makes a unique mount it uh, makes some neat stories as well uh and uh, again i think there's just as many people that you know if you were to ask them why they go out every year on september 1st the answer is going to be because season's not open august 31st <laughs> i think that's just I an important agree, yeah. important uh, uh point to make but it is kind of interesting because at that time are you going to see bucks together are they going to be hanging out together in my opinion, yeah, they, they still are. The testosterone hasn't quite hit that level to where they're really territorial yet. It's just kind of that first little spike of it that gets them, gets them to rub that velvet off. Um, I know, for example, I, uh, September 3rd, I watched three three bucks hanging out together. One shed, had already shed, shed his velvet. The other two are still full full velvet. So. Okay. And I got to admit, uh, if you see some 
bucks that you want to hunt uh, on your, your cameras or if you see them in your scouting, why not? Get out there. Uh, one thing I think of in September, especially even at uh, the beginning of October at times, they're still kind of patternable. The world is still kind of their oyster. They've got plenty of opportunity for food, shade, that, that temporary jungle, especially on the eastern side of the state where corn is raised. Uh, it's there. Yeah. Now the world starts changing a little bit though. Uh, and, and when those combines start rolling in that, that temporary, that summer forest starts to disappear, the acorns start falling. Jeff, what happens then? Well, and I was just going to say, you know, long before the combines, even you still got all kinds of different, uh, fruiting bodies in the, in the woods. You've got acorn mass starting to produce and fall. And, uh, that you're right. You hit the nail on the head, Hershey, that has a huge impact on deer movement and, and where you're going to see deer. And, and it can get frustrating sometimes. It, they, it can be also make them the most easy to pattern out of any time of the year. In my opinion, in September, if you've got an acorn tree that's producing mass, boom, get a stand or a blind over there. You're going to see deer. So Jeff, I know you talk about it quite a bit, you know, not all acorns are, are mighty the same. No, uh, and that's a good point, Hershey. You know, those uh, those acorns coming from the you know, uh, oaks and the white oak families that, that have the rounded lobed leaves on them uh, are, the, are certainly going to be those that uh, are a hot, lot uh, sweeter, a lot less tannic acid in those acorns, and so going to be preferred by deer. Now, the, the red oak, pin oak family, the real pointed, jagged leaves, real heavy points to them, uh, those are going to be a little more tannic acid. Now, the, you know, the, floor critter, the floor critters, squirrels and whatnot will take care of those, but deer are going to be going to those. Uh, in the white oak family rather heavily and uh, and that's where you want to focus your resources and it's one of those things that if there's a whole bunch of acorns on the ground one year they kind of spread out the deer really do uh it's those years that are magical where this oak not producing much that oak not producing absolutely much, and all of a sudden this one you find yep, is yep. and and they will come a long ways especially yeah. for those those acorns from those white oaks and that's where a little scouting goes a long way to look up and see which trees are looking to drop looking to really produce in that you know the burr oaks and that kind of thing and uh and then get after them and as soon as they start falling get a get a stand up there and be ready or a ground blind because uh it they'll clean up an area pretty fast and so if they start falling you might have weeks you know five days ten days depending on the tree and how many trees are in the area but they're certainly worth moving a stand for because uh, you can just about take it to the bank that's where deer are going to be you know, there you, you, go. you make a great point about different types of oaks and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, for people to be knowledgeable about deer is important and what they're eating is incredibly important. So if Absolutely. you're, if you can be the person who can identify those plant species and those tree species, um, they're going to have a leg up on someone who doesn't. Definitely. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Good, Definitely. Real good point. Yep. And that's uh, something we kind of talked about a little yesterday is, uh, or in the last podcast is not not every forest is made the same here in the state of Nebraska. And there's a reason why the deer are over there in that corner and not so much just over on this side. Uh, and they pick up on those things, but food is important. I mean, any animal you're hunting, but especially deer food. Yeah. Food yeah. is important. They're going to find food, especially those does throughout the year. But now that's kind of their main thing. They've got a, they've got a, uh, a tough test coming up through the rest of the fall and, and winter that they've got to store up some fat reserves. And, and right now when the food's available, Hey, nature and their adaptation say take advantage of it and the beautiful thing here in nebraska is we've got quite a bit but they have their favorites just like the rest of us we go to a grocery store aisles and aisles and aisles of food but we have certain spots that we always hit because those are where our food are that's our main staple out oh, there so be even, adaptable even specifically i mean think about like all the choices of apples we have but you've got your favorite <laughs> apple and it may not I be do. The, what's yeah, your favorite yeah, apple I'm, jackson I honey crisp oh, oh listen he does on. have yeah. a favorite my <laughs> wife knows where to find me in a grocery store i can tell you that right now I, I have my favorite spot it's not apples it's not apples you, no <laughs> i'm gonna say are you gonna ask me my favorite apple <laughs> what's your favorite apple caramel uh-huh yeah. i'm right there with you <laughs> yeah. That you yeah, and I can agree apple, on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that you and I can agree on. Uh, but we got to keep moving. And life of a deer. And apples are a great thing for, for a deer. Uh, if you've yeah. got an apple orchard nearby, oh, my goodness, yeah. if it, it produces. Um, but things don't stay so, uh, you know, even keel and, and bucks getting along a whole bunch. Uh, let's talk about when those combines start rolling. And after they've shed all that that velvet off their antlers, it's now they've got hard uh, bone or antler up on on top what starts happening in the deer woods in fact we hear it sometimes called the early october lull and, and it can be because there's so much so much that can uh, hide a deer as we in, in october and uh, that lull kind of starts to end 
when the combines come out, in my opinion. But until the combines come out, uh, sightings can go down, and it can be really frustrating because now all of a sudden all those those food sources that we could just pinpoint them by the time of day almost, within a couple of hours, uh, oak trees and whatnot, uh, those those sources dry up, and now deer kind of scatter a little bit. They're not they're not coming to the same sources anymore, and it just seems like, well, geez, we, it's harder to see deer, and they're out in the middle of a cornfield maybe you know 80% of their day, and so uh, that can have a huge impact. But when those combines, come out perhaps nothing in nebraska has as big an impact on deer movement into the rut uh, as those combines do and i even even during the rut they have an incredible impact on deer and so that is a that is something to set your clock by and make sure that you're out there deer hunting uh when when harvest is happening and certainly after it's happened because that's when all of a sudden deer movement starts to change drastically and your chances of being in a spot where a deer wants to be uh go up dramatically yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. I, I can think of a 100-acre cornfield with some timber along the edge. Maybe Crick runs through it. You know, they can roam just about anywhere they want to, but, but just travel corridors change quite a bit. Uh, let's put this in hunting perspective then, Jackson. During that early September time into that uh, October lull, we'll call it, you know, best times of day to hunt. Yeah, that's hard to say. I prefer afternoons at this time because it's a little bit more consistent on when those deer, you know, you can be pretty sure they're in the bedding when you get there and that they're going to come out, you know, I- ideally in your direction. Um, mornings, it's it's harder to pinpoint when they're going back to bed. So you may you may bump those deer. They may be earlier than you expected. And and okay. so it, you know, at, th- at that point, I'm weighing my but odds a little bit. Those are your two options, evening first but mornings yeah early mornings it'd be a, a second place right. distant second yeah. absolutely yeah. I'm, I'm a, i i think that uh, evenings are pretty good but uh right after harvest and i'm a firm believer that this happens because i've seen it too often uh and i'm talking days within days of harvest those deer in my opinion are very used to going out in that cornfield whenever they're hungry early in the afternoon nobody can see them nobody bothers them so they walk out there sometimes four five six you know six in the evening uh and it, and their and their stomachs are set to that just like your 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 bird dog you know you feed them a certain time every day they're hungry by that time every day and you take away that food source or you take away that cover food source is still there on the ground uh, i've seen deer going out into those fields still in the early afternoon early evening and so i want to hunt those as soon as harvest is done i want to get out there and hunt those evenings because the chance of seeing deer early in the afternoon are probably as good as they're going to be until we get to the rut and after about a week or so then that kind of fades away they get used to feeding later and and not having as much cover and so i think that fades but uh so i right after harvest i like to get out there and hunt Uh, outside of that mornings are my favorite okay but neither one of you are doing all day sits at that time of the season not yet i'm not yet Not yet. okay i wouldn't i wouldn't i I mean i have don't get me wrong and i've seen deer uh you know at all times of day but i i don't spend a lot of time out there in midday all right it's kind of about making the most hitting the the highest odds you know there's there's always a chance that a deer could be moving around midday they don't simply lay in their bed all day but if you're going to maximize your odds um and time in the stand i think i think at this point in the year what's your favorite and that's that's important well if i'm doing an all-day sit early in the season it's probably because i'm in a ground blind and i fell asleep (laughs) to be quite honest with you uh no i i agree these are animals that like low light conditions and this is the kind of the time when they're starting to shift from that that summer coat to that winter coat which isn't quite as evident as when they go from winter to, to summer coat by any means, but Hey, it's hot. It can be pretty darn warm here across uh, Nebraska and up in the high plains. And if I don't have to move while wearing a fur coat, I, I ain't moving. Yeah. Uh, you're right. It, they don't just bed down and, and spend 12 hours there on the ground. They've got to get up and move, but uh, it's probably not real far. off. And, and honestly, you hit a good point there because it absolutely is weather dependent movement. If it's, you know, we're like right now we're, we're in October and it's warm, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, real warm Octobers, you know, deer movement really slows down. That's the lull. And that's a big part of the lull as well. Crops in the field, hot days. Uh, they don't want to move. And you, like you said, they got that coat on. And so, you you know, cool mornings, um, you know, rain events or, or even, you know, snow events uh, it can really get deer movement. And so really weather dependent as well. There you go. And I just want to make sure that those that are listening uh, realize that early season, not the time to do an all day sit. That time is coming uh, and you don't want to burn yourself out because you're talking before, you know, the start official start of fall after the equinox. That's what, those are long daylight hours. Out well, there. they are. And you want to save some of that ability to sit 
all day long for when it's going to be prime. That's a good point because how many times have you and I gone through a turkey season and at the end of that turkey season, we're, we're done. I oh. mean, you know, we're, we've hunted so many days and been out so many times. It's like, whew, <laughs> what yeah. a ride, right? But yeah, yep. we're done. We're, we're, we're ready to move on to fishing and other, <laughs> other things. So, and, and we love turkey hunting. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Now let's get past the October lull. You know, the combines might be rolling on an average year and, and good amount of the beans and maybe corn and some of the other crops across the state are, are out. Things start happening. I mean, things all of a sudden start to pick up. Like you said, maybe it's because their travel corridor is a little bit reduced or maybe food sources aren't everywhere like they once were just days, weeks before. Uh, and, and you start seeing your buddy as that competition. I mean, just a little bit, but before we even get there, what are you starting to see on the ground, on the trees, that type of thing as we get towards the end of October? Yeah. Well, you're, you're losing your tree cover. It's going to start falling. Good thing. So we yeah. start seeing, and as far as the trees themselves, then you start seeing the deer sign. So oh, October is when the, the kind of the sign making for deer and bucks peaks. It's kind of this bell curve. And as we approach the rut, approach November, the peak of the rut, that sign making just goes through the roof so and what kind of sign making we talking we're about? talking rubs so rubs are you know that classic tree trunk just scraped up rubbed up no no um bark left on it and then our scrapes so the scrapes are uh pawing the ground getting that ground uh cover removed bare dirt they're peeing in it they got their preorbital glands in their eyes they're working the tree above above it um leaving that sign that scent and boy, does that make you excited oh, when you yeah. start seeing a scrape and seeing those rubs? Oh, now yeah. that you have to rub some of that velvet off, but it's not the same no. as what you start seeing no. late in October. Yeah, no, they're they're getting pretty aggressive. Uh, that that uh, testosterone's kicking in as the day length continues to uh, to recede, and they're getting pretty aggressive and they're hitting those trees. And I mean, they're rubbing rubbing scent on those trees. And uh, I don't know if they they know they're rubbing scent. I would you know have a hard time thinking they're doing it just to deposit scent. <laughs> I think they're sh taking out aggression. They happen to be putting scent on those trees as they're doing so, and other deer smell that. But uh, it's it's really to me it's aggression. It's it's taking out aggression and strengthening their neck muscles uh, muscles, and it does that. And again, I don't know if that's a secondary benefit, but it, absolutely prepares them for what's coming now it gets all the hunters excited especially when we start seeing the first time or two we see that first scrape we see the, those rubs or that line of them because you can sometimes it goes from one tree to yeah. the next one to the next yeah. one you can see them just working that aggression as they they move down the trail uh toss us out especially for those that might not have deer hunted a whole bunch as soon as you see that sign are you moving a stand to hunt those spots <laughs> that's a good question yeah and uh, i'm gonna let you start i i can, okay. tell you, I can go right away i can tell you what i do but if, if you want to you want to sure. jump in or you do it uh i use i don't necessarily hunt over that scrape i don't necessarily go i need to be right over top of that scrape um i usually back up a little bit towards their bedding or towards their feeding depending on kind of access and stuff like okay. that so i'm 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 off of that assuming they're gonna hit it at some point but uh but when they hit it is hard to pinpoint and if you're really good with trail cameras you'll notice that a lot of that sign making happens at night yep yep so um i'm not necessarily going i'm gonna go hunt that scrape tonight i'm, tr I'm trying to backtrack a little bit or forward track a little bit and uh and figure out you know that kind of travel corridor yeah and i mean i think you hit the nail on the head you know uh scrapes on the ground uh I, this is where your scouting pays off if if you're in a core area where there's deer active there's deer, deer moving through that area and it's a secure area probably a, a fairly thick wooded area uh then i might hunt those especially if i see activity on those consistently then i might hunt those but those that are made like on field edges i don't even bother with those because those are absolutely you know 90 percent of the time uh moonlight scra you know scrapes on the ground that uh, are, me are made as they're feeding through an area and they're just along the edge of a field and rarely rarely do i see any activity on those in daylight hours but in a core inner core area uh those can get me pretty excited you know and rubs the same way you know you see a lot of rubs but when you see if you know where a bedding area is and you know where they're feeding and you see a line of rubs connecting those two uh you can tell the direction that deer is traveling when they're making those rubs is in a morning or an evening trail those rubs can tell you a lot and i really like rubs and again do i see a lot of deer coming back to those rubs no but it right. does tell me a deer is traveling through that area to a general location and and that's reason to get excited hey i got deer here in this area they happen to be bucks uh as well and I, I i completely agree with what you guys are saying and it's amazing how many scrapes deer especially young deer will make 
and never come back to. Nothing ever stops by. They just kind of randomly make it in there. I know an old bow hunter told me, hey, if you want to see how active a scrape is, just, you know, cover it with some of the leaves. Just kick them around out there and come back the next time. See if those leaves have been removed. Because if they've been scraping at that ground, those leaves are going to be on the outside. Yep. But a lot of them just, hey. I think it is that frustration almost. I know there's something good that's yep, going to yep. be happening here It ain't soon. happening yet. <laughs> ain't, ain't happening now, yeah. And so we're going to try to make sign to kind of move it along yeah. uh, just a little bit. Anything else we want to say about October and leading up to this time? Well, what are the bucks doing as they're making these scrapes? And maybe even after we start seeing it, you know, a week or two after we start seeing those scrapes on the ground uh, and the rub lines uh, picking up and activity and things like that, you know, we're really not seeing those bucks together no more right they've split up they they know that that another buck is competition at this point so you likely won't see them together much anymore again they're animals they do what they want to do so you'll have somebody say i saw two bucks together in october but uh, (laughs) so i'm not saying it doesn't yeah jackson's a liar (laughs) no (laughs) yeah so i'm not saying it doesn't happen but it's a it's a rarity they're they're splitting up now they're viewing them as competition um, and then you might even see some light sparring in early October and heavy full on fighting in that last week, to, week to two weeks. And that's the time to bring out the red. Oh yeah. Isn't it? Like we talked the past podcast and, and we'll later on here, but this is where your hunting tactics have to change. If you want to maximize success, because all these things are telling you that deer are ripe for just pushing them over the edge just a little bit. Yeah, and uh, when they're frustrated, so they're goring up trees, they're so frustrated, they're making scrapes and they're fighting each other. This is the time to just get, tickle them a little more with the rattling antlers or something and just push them over the edge. And, man, this is where they can just send them right to you, yeah. Now, in our Learn to Hunt workshops where we talk spring turkey hunting, and we're, we might have to do a how-to turkey uh, this uh, this coming year. But that said, it always seems to me like the, the males, when it comes to turkeys, are more in the mood for the breeding season or their version of the rut long before the the females same thing in the from your experience same thing in whitetails and and the deer here in nebraska are the bucks doing that a little bit more and the does are still going about normal 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 daily life walking back which is what frustrates those bucks even more i mean (laughs) because the the does hardly know the rut is going on aren't starting to go on they're just feeding same trails and and of course we talk strategies there's a strategy in that there's a huge strategy in that and as those males you know get frustrated with each other and kind of get frustrated that that the does aren't aren't playing the game yet i think that's when you start to see some of these bucks kind of having to ease out in other territories and, and moving out not at the peak of that perhaps but yeah. you might all of a sudden look across and especially if you're somebody like jackson that knows all his deer by name it's kind of like oh that's i thought that was eddie but that's definitely not eddie that's something different he's got a drop time that's a brand new deer out there you got him named you a few of them don't you one of them, <laughs> one of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay all of them <laughs> But I think you start seeing that a little bit more, which makes hunting exciting. I mean, that's part of it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, no question about it. And then as the does start getting excited, which what, usually early November? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that first week in November, end of the first week in November is before they really start thinking about it. You know, that's... bucks think about it for months. <laughs> does think about it for about a week. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and we get into the rut. Now, we're not going to talk about it quite yet because we want to figure out what causes that rut. You hear a lot of different things on message boards, on Facebook, on on uh, group chats and magazines. Just like, oh, boy, here's the full moon. This is when it's going to start. Oh, boy, here's a cold front coming. Here's where it's going to start. All this and that, Jeff. When does the rut start in Nebraska? It, day length. It has nothing to do with a date or a time. It's pretty close to certain dates, but uh, it's just a change in day length causing the rut. And uh, as that day length gets shorter and it gets to a maximum, you know, some sort of a minimum amount, uh, it really kicks in the rut activity. And uh, and that's how we see the rutting activity happening in South Texas and in Nebraska and in North Dakota, all throughout the Whitetails uh, range and spectrum there from in, in North America, happening at consistent times throughout. You know, it's a hundred, might be a hundred degrees in texas when the rut starts that doesn't stop the rut it might be you know at 15 20 degrees in north dakota when the rut's really kicking in it doesn't you know it doesn't change it it's just 
day length. Is, give is give me proof. Give me proof that the rut doesn't change a whole bunch from year to year. Give it well, to me. Yeah. Give it to <laughs> me, Jack. When our, when our fawns are dropping, it's very consistent uh, after, after as we get into the next season. So uh, we know we know pretty good fact that the rut, it, it, you know, all these other factors have impacts on the rut. Uh, you know, for example, deer may be rutting at the same time, but how aggressive they are about the rut uh, can be hampered by weather. If it's 75, 80 degrees and you're wearing a full coat and, and you got to chase down every every girlfriend you find it's not going to be a, a positive experience right so those deer are going to have to uh, adjust and, and that happens so what happens changes their movement to nighttime and a lot of time hunters will oh they're not rutting very hard that's not even kicked in yet because i haven't seen me it's kicked in and deer are rutting when they can but it's 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 on that's all yeah. although when, when people say the rut's early this year oh, or yeah, the or rut's early, late this year them out, right moving around no and it's yeah. no weather just conducive to daylight yep. chasing yeah. versus nighttime chasing yep and, and it's that that localized impacts maybe right and and what what actually uh is a rut i mean is it just seeing one buck cross during the daylight that all takes. To be following a <laughs> yep. doe, or is it several of them where yeah. that doe i'll go with the first one <laughs> i got one buck chasing a doe it's on uh but you know go back to even what you said about harvest earlier you know we've heard hunters you know in days and years where harvest was really late in nebraska help mm-hmm. oh, ruts real late you know you know, the rut doesn't follow harvest. It's just that rut's going on. You don't see it. Yeah. If it's a cornfield, you're not going to see the rut occurring in a cornfield. Yeah. So it, it mutes prime it. Prime example. I think you guys have seen this as well. In years where the the corn is up even past our November rifle season, uh, I'm always shocked at how many big bucks you see just stand right on the edge of a cornfield. No trees in sight, no creek, no nothing. They've been moving around those those corn rows and, and invisible, like you talked about earlier, Jeff. And they just know there ain't, there aren't any hunters in this the stand at cornfield there are down in that ditch and over in that creek and all that <laughs> type of stuff yep. and if the does are go, going in there why leave yeah why leave yeah. so so all right now we, we've got an idea of what starts it and we've got some of the local factors that can influence it uh, let's get jump into it. what's happening what 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 is the rut for somebody that that might be brand new to deer hunting because this is one we get deer hunters we use that term over and over and over and over again the rut the rut the rut yep. uh we dream about it, we take it off uh, work so we can go hunt it and all that stuff that's the breeding season uh what's happening Why, how do the deer change during this time what what makes it so magical jackson uh i mean the hormones go, go crazy both bucks and does when they're when when it meets up and they're both in the mood it's uh it's an incredible time to be out there there's you know you can kind of forget that afternoon morning hunts you go when you can go okay if you can be in the stand you should be in the stand basically like from from halloween and maybe even a couple <laughs> days before through third week in november if you be can be the out there, if you've got the time and the gumption, <laughs> yeah, yeah. if you're a deer hunter, you want to be yeah, out there. there. And if you're not, time. Yeah. yeah. Good point. <laughs> yep. Good point. And, and there's really two phases to it because there's, and you said this earlier, Jackson, you know, the bucks are ready, right? I mean, you know, September, they already, they already know what life's about. They know what their purpose is in September. Uh, but the does, it takes a lot longer for that change uh, that uh, to occur in does before they go uh, into estrus, which is, which is key. And, you know, and here from here on out, it gets very violent. Biological. I mean, it's a lot of sense. It's a lot of sight. It's a lot of of uh, is is this deer going to be a, a hard one to chase, or is it going to slow? Is she going to slow down? And because of, of of the situation she's in, and is it going to be easier for that buck to find that doe? Uh, and so receptive. it really gets by. Yeah, receptive. receptive yep. as, as, and I mean, sometimes it's not so much the receptive. It's there's a lot of chasing going on, right? And I mean, it's just a lot of you know wearing it wearing each other down. Uh, but but yeah, there is that element of it too. But it's very biological at that point. And when all those sights and smells start occurring, uh, for bucks, it's on. I mean, they've been waiting for months. And now it's nothing's going to stop. We're gonna we're gonna chase and find those does, and uh, and that's of course that chasing phase is what we we tune into. So for us. Yep. When it comes to the rut, what we're really keying in on as hunters, and most hunters just think of the rut, is that chasing phase. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. That chasing phase, that first really, you know, October twenty whatever yeah. to 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 middle of November is the chasing phase. Yeah, yeah. those are yep. the ones not only dream about, but those are the memory makers. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've been in the woods before where all of a sudden, you know. They're running around like squirrels. They're chasing each other. There's a lot of noise happening. I mean, when you think of a 200-pound squirrel running through the, the, the leaf-strewn bottom uh, river woodlands, I mean, that it's just fun. You know something's happening. Uh, and you've got also last year's fawns. 
uh, that have kind of been separated from mom. So they're moving around the landscape. So you, oftentimes if you're in the right spot, there's a heck of a show yeah. to listen to, to watch. Uh, and it might not be happening right underneath your stand if you're with a bow and arrow, uh, but it, it's taking place and it's just kind of neat. You just, like you said, this is the time now, right? You're sitting all day. Yeah. And it can happen at any moment. Yeah. It can yeah. be a slow morning. And then all of a sudden the next 30 seconds are the most intense of your deer hunting career. You, yep. you, you hit it. In fact, when we're hunting during the rut, you know, we might run back to the truck to get a snack or something and, and touch base at, you know, noon or something. See, what do you see? What I see? Uh, or run back to the cabin or back, you know, campsite or whatever. But, you know, it's a short, it's a short uh, run back to the cabin. It's back out in the field and it's pretty much all day long. Yeah. And it's, you'll be surprised how many opportunities you'll find between 10 and 1, 10 and 2 that uh, a lot of hunters miss. Uh, in fact, I'm also, I'm also convinced that when you're in the field during those times and there's in, with the areas that are heavily hunted, that can really work to your advantage mm -hmm. in the rut because I think most hunters by 10 o'clock are heading out of the tree stand to go back and get something to eat, stretch, you know, stretch their legs, whatever. And there's a lot of deer pushing that goes on between 10 and 11 o'clock. And if you're in the stand at that time, that can be killer. I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly there. All right. So on my list, Kayla's got written down seek chase. We've kind of talked about that. The breeding is this kind of the, the lockdown phase because once that doe is receptive and, uh, and willing, able to be bred, I mean, biologically speaking, that buck's not going to leave her. No, he is locked down Absolutely. with her. If she beds down, he beds down. If she stands up, he stands up. If she walks out to get a uh, bite to eat, he's walking out to get a, a bite to eat. That thing, I, I think sometimes that's where the rut, uh, folks will see that part of it and just say, they're not rutting in my area. Well, you might not be in that area where those deer are really hanging out. Um, same thing though, just wait them out or do you guys uh, change your strategies? There's, there's two strategies when you see that happen or when you notice that happening. Um, but like you said, when a buck finds a receptive doe, he's going to be with her and they're going to go to the thickest, most secluded and oftentimes overlooked patch that they can, that they have a deer love nest. Okay. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So if, if you see that, if you physically see that doe and that buck in that area, uh, try to get in there. If you can get in there without the doe noticing you you're golden you have a you're you're done that buck is Piece not paying cake. attention that buck is yeah, yeah easier said than done i understand the but, only one with their thinking but, cap on still. yes we got to sneak past her exactly That's not easy technically <laughs> technically you've got four eyes and four ears in there yeah. but really only one pair is paying attention yeah, exactly okay yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah all right all right before yep. before kayla starts hitting the uh the beat button here, yeah. let's <laughs> keep a pg all right so go after them yeah is one strategy make a move yep what's the other the other is that those travel cords or so just like almost any rut thing um when that buck when they're when they're done he he's on to the next man he's like let's go find the next one so it's uh it's that travel corridor and where they could be moving from doe bedding area to doe bedding area okay so that's that's so where I, mean. I key in on during the rut all right so jeff we're sitting here just a few days into october as we record this this podcast uh and i know one of the things that you talk about for getting ready for the rut is not necessarily finding where those bucks are, but finding where those those doors are. And you kind of alluded to that, I think, a little bit there, Jackson. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, you know, exactly right, Hirsch. You know, I don't I don't go around chasing a lot of buck sign during the rut because the buck sign doesn't mean a lot during the rut. When the rut is on, especially when we go from the chasing to the breeding phase, uh, things can appear like they've slowed down a little bit. And so then I go back to my scouting and I look for those does. And I look for areas where I know does are going to be, trails that I know are used by does, connecting feeding and bedding areas, feeding areas areas that I know does frequent because uh, I don't know how many bucks I've harvested over the years and it's been plenty that uh, I've sat in an area where I know it's evening does are going to appear in this spot and sure enough they do hop the fence here they are in the field and right behind them is one or two big bucks and it's like you know clockwork boom because I don't know how to find those bucks uh, when they're running all over the place but I do know how to find what they're looking for and if we're both in the same spot of what they're looking for uh, things come together pretty fast and so to me that's key hunt the does you'll find the bucks especially during the peak of the rut good good points now talk a lot about bucks during this rut and I think that's what a lot of folks dream about whether you've been hunting for a year uh, 10 years, 20 years, whatever. It's it, it's part of it. Uh, Dozo, if you've got an antlerless tag, I've got to say of all the seasons or time periods to try to fill that antlerless tag, the rut can be one of the 
the most challenging to fill with a mature doe. Uh, yep, you can probably find an antlerless deer because there's going to be some wandering that, that aren't in estrus, that aren't aren't playing that game, or we're not responsive, or maybe a, a buck fawn that's moving around that uh, you know been bumped away from mom. But those does seem to be on edge at times because not only are they looking out for danger and they're used to looking out for their uh, fawns from last year if they had them uh, and keeping themselves safe from predators, four-legged, two-legged, whatever it might be, now all of a sudden they're getting chased by these bucks. And sometimes those young bucks, no pun intended, uh, really hound the snot out of them. And pretty soon they're just kind of shy. I've seen full mature does bolt fastest from young bucks during the rut. I mean, they just see them, they just stop and they, the eyes get big, the ears go in that direction. Yep. As soon as they identify boom, they're gone. So that young buck doesn't start chasing because I'm not sure that those young bucks completely understand what's going on. They just know <laughs> they got to be part of it. And the only way to be part of it is be by that doe. <laughs> they just know to be excited. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah exactly. So how long does the, the rut last then? So it, it really depends on, 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 on a few factors, but generally speaking, you're, you're talking as we get into late, you know, you could say all, you know, a lot of October is rut activity or rut timing, but the, the rut where we are talking about the chase phase, you know, you're talking usually from, you know, toward the end of October in through the middle of November. So there's about a, you know, um, you know, 14 to 21 day period that I would say is what I would call true rut activity true rut. in the sense that we're, we're used to seeing signs. There you go. That's the time to take off work. Call in, call in say, that's what sick leaves for. Yep. Two mm-hmm. weeks out of 52. I mean, that's that, that, that's pretty good. So, Jackson, as we start coming out of the rut, we get towards the end of November, maybe Thanksgiving, early December. You know, rut's dying down a little bit. What I mean, what are the deer focusing in on now? So there's there's two changes. You know, after the, the what we refer to as the heat of the rut in that November time frame, the, the bucks are worn down. They have gone through a lot they put their bodies through the ringer so they're they're going to be keying back in on food sources but there's also kind of a second rut that happens in december so are we are we to that point do we want to oh, touch on yet. that yeah, okay we'll, all right we'll get into that a little bit more okay but yeah talk about that because one thing that i don't think a lot of hunters do my long no matter how long they've hunted don't realize is we actually lose some of our mature buck deer every year because of the rigors of the rut yeah they're just not able to recover from that Brutal. physically. Yep. Uh, they just, they spent so much energy chasing does, finding uh, does to breed, carrying on the species, because that's success. The, the uh, carrying on of your genes that uh, they just can't find enough food. Something happens, cold snap, uh, resources, whatever it is, too worn down. They just don't recover. Yep. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, pu- you hear people talk about finding some dead deer after season and, you know, People say it might have been a bad shot or something like that, but I'd I'd wager that a decent chunk of those deer that people are seeing just simply didn't have what didn't didn't have the resources in their body, and uh, yeah, that that was it for them. It's it's a cost. Yeah, there, there really is a cost. Yeah. Now the does, they seem to get back in a normal. Oh, yeah. the, the fawns from last year, if they had them, come back. They still food bedding food bedding that type of stuff and the bucks try to do that as well uh what kind of food sources are they hitting at that point you know Chuck? it's it's usually you know, the grains are pretty heavy for them you know the what's going to give them the right amount the, the hot, heaviest amount of nutrients for the least amount of work and so now they're focusing on going back to fields that haven't been harvested yet those are killer uh mm-hmm. fields that were harvested sloppy uh you know they're not in the, you know the source of food that was in the woods and mass and all that kind of stuff has waned quite a bit by now we've had good frost and freezes so a lot of the annuals are less palatable anymore or been killed off by the frost and so now we're talking waste grain and and then unharvested fields being a a big portion of their diet and uh, it's amazing what you can find especially as we get into december with some of those corn fields that haven't been harvested and deer maybe for miles will be hitting those those fields because it's just easy sources of food right there on the stock this is when you'll either see a ton of deer as we get into december and january and cold snaps and stuff this is when you'll either see a ton of deer or you will see no deer. And that's because they herd up like that. Good you know. point. Good point. Now, before we jump into that, that mid December through January, that kind of late, late season or muzzleloader season for those that, uh, uh like to, to shoot black powder. Um, let's talk about it. You kind of broke the subject there, the second rut. And this is one I think a lot of folks talk about. Uh, they've experienced it maybe a little bit, they're believers, or they really haven't seen much of it. So they don't believe in it. Uh, Walk us through that. What is the second rut? Yep. So 90, or sorry, 
30, 28 days after the, the, the doe comes into estrus and the first time in November, she, if she's not bred in no, November, she'll come into estrus again in December. So you get a little bit of those does. So if, you're, if your buck to doe ratio in your area is skewed, you, you might see that, those mature does. Um, and then you'll also see the, the fawns from that, that year. Once they hit about 90 pounds, it's a, it's a pound poundage thing. Once they hit that weight, then they can come into estrus. And it's usually right in Just line with later. that December that December first, second week of December time frame. And so they come into estrus. Do we see the same amount of activity? And does it follow the same, you know, seek chase breed uh, lockdown that we were talking about before? How it's kind of condensed. Okay. And it, again, it depends on the herd makeup in your area. So every area is a little bit different. Um, but if you see that really high buck to doe ratio where there's a ton of does to a buck, um, you'll see this more pronounced, um, and it may be similar. And if you hit it on the right day, it can be very similar. Very intense. Yeah. But if you if you take you know November twelfth, and that's a ten on the, a ten out of ten, the December rut is going to be you know second rut's going to be somewhere in that six to seven oh, out of ten. So, in so my not opinion. Bad. Oh no, on the bad. right day, it's going to be it can be flat out awesome. Don't no don't knock it, but uh, but don't expect it to be like November. Is, is that one of those things that like, well, and, and maybe that's the best way to say it. All right. Hope for it. Hope you see it, but don't, don't game plan it. completely around that. I wouldn't put all your chips in that basket, but it's, it's going to be happening. And I know, you know, a lot less, yeah, a lot less does, you know, in, in, mm-hmm. in asterisk. So that, that has an impact. Oh. Yeah. And, and I think it has a lot to do with the age, age structure of the, of the buck herd too. So Seeing it is one thing. All right. I mean, that, that one's, that one's pretty easy. Are there any other signs? If you don't see deer, are there any other signs that these deer leave behind that you can tell? Well, maybe there's a doe or a, a fawn that coming into cycle in my area in, in that time frame for that second rut, or there's things that you look for. Well, you start to see some of the same similar type of activity, right? You'll start to see even some scraping activity on frozen ground and whatnot. And so you'll see some of that. But uh, to me, the you know, I don't get too excited unless I actually see, you know, bucks chasing does uh, or bucks hanging around does. Uh, from what I've seen in the second round, it's even not even so much chasing a lot of time. It's just there's does walking across the field and a buck trailing them. And it's like... Oh yeah, he doesn't. There we reason. go. Yeah, it's on again. Yeah. You know, but to me, it's very muted compared to the first rut. Uh, quite by quite a bit muted, because uh, even the bucks, I think, don't have the gas in the tank to have go through the same rigam and roll that they did the first time around. So, yeah, even that's very muted. But uh, but I do see more mature bucks uh, participating in it more so than the younger bucks. But uh, you know, but it's it's one of those things where if you're into sense and all that, you know, as we get into December, uh, it's not a bad idea to throw those out again. I don't hmm. rattle a lot in December. I do some rattling, but the amount of, of uh, deer that I intercept with rattling is severely reduced in December as it was, you know, compared to late October, early November. Jeff made a good point there about mature bucks, um, really keying in on this December time frame. I don't, and, and I can't verify this. I'm not a deer, but it seems to me like you're half the younger. Deer. I can tell you right now, you're half deer. <laughs> when he's not a duck, he's yeah. a deer. Yeah. <laughs> when, uh, I, I just don't think those little bucks know that it's coming and there's not as many receptive and good smelling does out there. And so I think the, the big bucks, <laughs> the mature bucks have, that have been through it before, they're like, I know it's coming. I know, I know to be looking for these, for these, That's uh, does it. out That's there. And they the young bucks, they, they you know, they're, they're just kind of like, Hey, it's December now. You know? like, oh, what was that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now so. I gotta say, cause I like muzzleloader season that's one of the the many ways i like to pursue deer here in the state of nebraska and if i'm going out early i'm going to take that advice that you kind of tossed out there jeff i'm going to hunt those does when they come out of that cornfield or if they're going into a certain area and bedding area uh, that's advice. where i see some of those bucks sneak down around sniff it get downwind just to see if there's anything uh that smells good that any uh does or fawns coming into estrus and then he'll go in there if he does uh but if you can f- see that and see where the, they like to bed or they're coming out to feed those bucks will kind of move from spot to spot just to try to check it out and like you said sometimes that's the mature ones probably figuring out i'm not going to spend any more energy than i have to unless i then the situation's well, right and you're a you're a december muzzler guy right i mean you you spend some time in december what do you see having the most impact on deer movement in december is it the second rut or i'd say i'd say food is hugely important and the colder it gets, which is this next step, bingo. <laughs> the colder it gets, the more weather we have. Uh, the it's a test. I mean, because you're getting to that time of year where they need more food, but there's getting to be less of it. Yeah. So now it, it becomes even more uh, 
uh, important. So let's go there. Let's say, let's get past the second rut there. And let's talk about that end of December, end of January, cold weather, snow, all of a sudden, first of all, what are those deer doing? Do you see them spread across the, the landscape as much as they were during the rut? No, no. Why they're, not? They're, they're yarded up for two reasons. Um, preferred food sources, and they don't go far from those preferred food sources. The farther you have to go, the f- more calories you have to expend, and that can be life-threatening in the in, in cold, serious weather. So they're close to that preferred food source, um, and there's usually a lot of deer there. Just, okay. What kind of what kind of uh, habitat are they using, Jeff? I, cornfields got that, and know what those look like. But you know, what kind of winter habitat? It's got to look a little different than what they're using right now in early October. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is, and usually it's going to be the thickest cover you have in an area, uh, and so yep, yeah, it can be it can be heavily heavily uh, weeded and heavily grass CRP fields. Uh, it can be uh, crick bottoms, a lot of crick bottom activity as we get into winter. But uh, you know, the, the idea that Jackson said is is so prominent that because they don't want to get too far from that food source, because at this time of year, you know, a snowstorm can keep you out of the field for days if you've got a if you if you're if you're a quarter mile from a, your your best food source so now they're changing their bedding location so they can bed closer to that food source and so it's a lot of thick timbered draws the thickest gnarliest draws that put them right in position uh for that food source especially when they can get the sun you know early on and uh, and they got something block the wind and and that's key shelter belts you know thick grass weedy shelter belts can be key uh but anything that just if you look at it and say man it's cold and windy out i'd take cover over there that's probably it's a deer, deer thinking similar uh, things. Cedars. That's what's the first yeah. thing that pops oh, my yeah. mind. Oh, yeah. in, Cedars in are Nebraska. huge cover. Yeah, if huge got, cover. It's you amazing. Some... The, just a little roll in the, the landscape, how they can find those little pockets that are out of the wind. Catch that southern sun, which you're going to have in the wintertime, uh, and it, it makes a world of difference. You crawl up under or behind a cedar on a cold, wintry day, it's amazing how much how much yeah. you know protection you can find, especially when you've got those kind of interspersed. It's not like a thick cedar patch yeah, where everything's yeah. dead underneath. Yeah, but if you've got some interspersed cedars and like Good some point. CRP yeah. grasses, oh, even that's, better, even better. Yeah, that's that's where I at. like it, and it is feast or famine. If you're not seeing deer um, in those cold weather months where you're hunting. Go someplace else because that's uh, they're just not going to be there. I know Kit Hams, one of our former big game program managers here, talked about that is throughout the fall, throughout the rut, these deer are moving out in different habitats that are probably great for that time of the year, but he'd consider them kind of marginal habitats and in, in areas as a whole. But as it gets cold and we get into winter and, and things are into that uh, survival mode, he says, then they come back to the core areas. They come back to where the, there's food, there's shelter, those main spots that, that uh, support that, that deer herd. And you gotta, gotta find it. Snow. I love snow. Uh, I gotta imagine you guys too uh, do as well because nothing gives away the spot of a deer. We talked about this uh, last time with Kayla on the, uh, where to deer, you know, you can't have a deer walk through snow and it doesn't give away its location. Yep. And you can really zoom in on areas that they're using and even more importantly, where they're not using. So you're not going to waste your time out there as well. But you got to say muzzle loaders and those late rifle uh, hunters that are go out during that antlerless season in January have got to be the ones that are just smiling when they see that weatherman saying cold front coming through frigid Absolutely. temperatures, highs in the teens, lows in the single digits or below zero. They just, we smile. Yep. We really do. Yep. Yep. We head into the cold. We head into the snow. Yep. Absolutely. Ahead of it or behind it? What do you prefer? I, I, oh, I like ahead of it. I like ahead of it. He says both. I, you can tell. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really don't have a preference on one or the other. Um, I really have found that like the first couple hours after it wanes, like oh, snow stops, skies, maybe yeah. this clear sky is again. The sky is clear. <laughs> that's. So I don't like me, walking through snow drifts. So I like to get out ahead of it. I don't like burning that much energy myself. And so, uh, you know, yeah, that e- you know, and it's hard to right because the snow might be coming on a day you can't get out, or it might be you know midday and you can't get out midday or something. But uh, if you can get out ahead of that snowstorm, sometimes even you know if it's supposed to snow tonight, get out there you know mid afternoon, early afternoon, and hunt all the way into that snowstorm because. Uh, you know, where it's safe to do so because, uh, that movement is, is pronounced. And I have seen so many times where I've been 
out hunting ahead of the snowstorm in deer out in the middle of a cornfield three Already. in the afternoon. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, and yep. and they're usually using the lowest uh, the lowest spot in the field to go out in that field because they're they're not comfortable going out there at three in the afternoon, but they have to, yep. and so they're using as much cover as they can they can find to get out there. And that's something to keep in mind. You know, if you're going to try to hunt those deer when a snowstorm's coming and they're going to head out in the field, find that spot where they should be coming out in the field that gives them the most protection, most cover. And I bet you can get pretty darn close in your yep. setup. Yep. And, and uh, again, some of those areas, those core areas where they're going to find some of that habitat, some of that food on public areas, on public uh, wildlife management areas, state recreation areas, uh, some of our partner grounds, things like that. We're, we're kind of coming to the end of this. It's been long, a lot of great information here because I think uh, biology is really how hunters do well. Scouting, big part of it. Biology, knowing what to look for, when to look for it, and, and how things happen or using landscape huge as well. Let's talk about this because I know that Jackson said he wasn't going to be part of this unless we talked about after winter or maybe after the season was still winter but after uh, Take it the away, season's <laughs> all closed down uh is a great time not to hunt deer necessarily but get ready for deer hunting season that's coming up you know the next year bingo yeah no this so is through that so you know i i don't go in and pressure them right away I, you know, especially if it's frigid like this last year we had that february snowstorms and it was frigid temperatures i'm not going in right then I don't want to put any more pressure on those deer than they already have on them. Um, but once it starts to warm up, we get some of those days in the 40s and 50s and whatnot, I'll go out there and I'll start taking a look around. I'll see where I can find beds. Maybe there's still a little bit of snow on the ground. Um, those trails are going to be beaten down. Uh, the grass and stuff hasn't grown back yet, and you can really get a good idea of how those deer are using the landscape. Um, and, and then we get into, you know, end of February, March, beginning of April, and those bucks are shedding their, their antlers. And that's one of my favorite times to be out there too. <laughs> I, there's just something about sheds that just gets me going. So I, I love to get out there and find them. It tells me about what the deer are doing, not necessarily exactly where that shed is, but all the other sign. There you go. And, yep. and uh, for our listeners that might not uh, do a lot of deer hunting yet, uh, a shed. What is what uh -huh. is that? What are you? What sure. are we talking about here? So uh, deer, elk, moose. Uh, they're any true antlers. Uh, they they regrow them every year. So they they drop off their head at the end of the season or uh, you know certain time of the year, and then they start growing that next set. So uh, yeah, that shed is just uh, that that last year's antler that uh, they don't need anymore. They've discarded. And, and I think this goes back to the whole idea. The only thing that's just as much fun as hunting is thinking about the next hunt. And I think that's where shed hunting really gets exciting is this deer survived the season. Yeah. This deer is in uh, using this area or has used this area. Good chance they're going to be there in this fall. They're going to be just a little bit older, maybe a little bit wiser, a little bit bigger, whatever, but it, they're here. They're here. And you're already planning for the, the following chances. Season. Chances are if they survived to drop their sheds, they're yeah. likely, you know, obviously they're sure. still wild animals and they got a lot to go through, but likely if they shed their antlers they're going to be around come next september a lot better than when you find that skull down in yeah. the, the river from <laughs> yeah. a deer not making it from and a that, deer collision that you find those too yep car collision but yeah that's exactly right so uh, i guess you can say it doesn't deer go through the entire year they change what's going on what their most important survival is always a big part of that uh, obviously but adapting your hunting strategies are just as important into those things and knowing what they're doing and and so you can be where they are and and uh, take advantage of what's happening in their world any last thoughts before we close this one off this has been one of our longest podcasts yeah, it has. <laughs> in episode four but hey we covered a full 12 months in this one yeah uh, so uh, a lot of good information here this is worth a, a, a at least a couple of of listens right there so anything else jeff you want to add I'd say don't take our word for it get out and see what deer oh. are doing all year long all scouting right. deer year round is, is a fun endeavor you'll learn a ton and uh, you'll either verify what we're saying or you'll learn more than you learn from this podcast yeah. and that's what we hope to see you do and if you've learned something different that we need to know comment yeah. you know yeah. go to hunt nebraska yeah. and let us know about it say jeff was full of you know, and then tell us why. When you, you see those two it, bucks yeah. together at the end of October, you can call me a liar and you can you, <laughs> le leave a comment. <laughs> it happens. There yeah. you go. It yeah. happens. Yeah. Just like we say, we've said it on this podcast before and our other things, a lot of research, a lot of scientific paper, a lot of magazine articles written about white-tailed deer and mule deer. And the deer haven't read one of them. So they're going to do what <laughs> they want to do. Go on out do it. and spend a year as a deer. There you go. <laughs>
All right, with that, we got to sign off. I know we've got two more uh, episodes in this one. We're going to be talking about uh, strategy uh, here in just a bit, as well as holy bleep, I got a deer when you're successful and how to deal with that. Again, give us a like, uh, subscribe to this Hunt Nebraska podcast so you can uh, learn more about how to deer and see some of the other cool things we got up our sleeves. And give us a like on Facebook. Hunt Nebraska, brought to you by your Nebraska Game and Parks Commission.